the issue of what to do with the people who lose their lives in World War II is incredibly important and incredibly interesting. And during the fighting, it's incredibly urgent. You know, combat produces, uh, you know, just horrifying uh, numbers of, of dead bodies and those bodies have got to be buried. They have got to get under the surface of the earth because they are a terrible health hazard. So in the American armies, there are special graves registration units that follow the frontline combat troops, um, you know, to identify and then bury in, in temporary cemeteries those who have been killed in the fighting. The story that's visible to us through the American Battle Monuments Commission cemeteries, those very iconic and, and beautiful tributes to the fallen, um, happens you know, half a decade or a decade later. That's something you need to remind yourself of when you visit. It's not immediately obvious, but it's important because it reminds us that the ABMC cemeteries are the product of choices, that individuals and groups sat down to think about the most appropriate way to pay tribute to people who were killed in the line of duty in the service of the country. So anybody who walks through the, the rows at any one of the ABMC World War II cemeteries is very quickly struck by the uniformity of it. Row after row after row of white marble crosses with an occasional Star of David mixed in. But those are the only two symbols. The decision to have everything the same is, I think, one of the things that these cemeteries are just so profoundly powerful. Uh, you stand out and you look at just this sea of loss. The cemeteries and the decisions are privileging certain kinds of American values, and there's no more important one in those cemeteries than equality. The cemeteries are not segregated by race. They don't separate the officers and the enlisted into separate groups. There are occasions where you'll find a pair of brothers who are buried side by side, or you'll find uh, friends whose parents had asked to have them interred side by side. But in general, uh, you know, there is no pattern, and the message that you get is equality. The only tombstones that are different at all are the Medal of Honor winners, who have a, a gold indication. But even those are not separated and put at the front of the cemetery. You will find them if you walk the rows, but they are, they are scattered. The decision to make everyone uniform gives it this power, but it also puts some other values, I think, a little bit in the background. The thing that brings home the reality of these cemeteries as choices for me and I think for a lot of the people who participate in this program, is the chance to visit other cemeteries, and particularly other nation cemeteries, because you can see then the choices that other countries have made. The British cemetery did not have nearly the same visitor traffic when we were there. It has certain similarities. The tombstones are laid out in neat rows, and it, there's a certain sense of uh, reverence there. But one of the things that was absolutely mesmerizing to me is the way in which the British tombstones allow the families to pay a more personal tribute. So some of the information is the same. There is a, a regimental badge, the soldier, um, how old they were, and the unit they served with. But there's also a place to personalize the plot a little bit. Uh, as I understand it, the British could choose from a short list of plants that they wanted there. And there's also part of the headstone that the family could personalize with a, a piece of text. Part of that has to do with the fact that for every American family who is lost, there is a choice involved. The American government will bury your, your loved one in one of the ABMC cemeteries. The American government will bring the remains home so that you can inter them in a national cemetery where the American government will return the remains and allow you to bury them in your private cemetery. That isn't an option for the British. And the British economy is wrecked during the, the Second World War, and the British government cannot bring home the remains of every loved one. But even a, a, a brief walk through the headstones is absolutely heartbreaking because you see in a, in a very deep way the loss that's been left to that particular family. 
And then there are a couple that really stand out. Some of them have a slightly acerbic tone. Uh, there's one that says, he gave his life, we hope not in vain. And that struck me as the kind of message that you can't really say in an American cemetery because the ABMC cemeteries are, are filled with the powerful idea that this was worth it, that the defeat of fascism and the, the effort to make the world safe for self-government justifies the loss. That's certainly, I think, the message, the official message of the British cemetery, but a tombstone that says, he gave his life, we hope not in vain, kind of opens that a crack of perhaps it wasn't worth it for our family. The even more interesting case, of course, is the German cemetery. What do you do to the soldiers who are killed on the losing side? There is nothing um, glorious to take away from being killed in the, in the defense of Nazi Germany. Not surprising in a lot of ways. It's much more somber. The day that we visited also happened to be overcast and a gentle drizzle was falling, which just added to this sort of sense of tension visible there between paying tribute to people who were killed and whose families mourn them and not celebrating what it is that they fought for, which is a really, really difficult tension to balance. It threw some of the differences in the way these nations reflect on loss and think about what the war was about into really sharp relief. So the thing that, that I got out of visiting the German cemetery was new questions to ask as I went to the ABMC sites. And, and, as, and I thought about how to juxtapose the choices that ABMC made in their cemetery layouts versus the other ways to do things.